Welcome everyone to the third webinar of Obesity 2020, a joint webinar series brought to you by Inside Scientific and the American Physiological Society. Between now and December, we have a number of line webinars lined up, all focused on the science being conducted by leading obesity researchers around the world. This is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. This webinar is titled Calories, Carbs, or Quality, What Matters Most for Body Weight, and will feature Dr. Kevin Hall, Section Chief of Integrative Physiology at the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Hall will talk about how our bodies adapt to various changes in our diet. For example, if you want to lose weight, is it better to reduce your fat or reduce your carbs? And what about highly processed foods? What's their impact on obesity and body weight? I'm sure everyone's really looking forward uh, to getting started, but first we'd like to acknowledge our partners at the APS and thank the sponsors of this webinar series for making it all possible. And with that said, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kevin Hall. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us today, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thanks very much, and thanks for all those who are attending live. Um, so the topic of my uh, talk today is calories, carbs, or quality, what matters most for body weight? And we'll just jump right in and start talking about calories, since that's been a topic of much confusion, I think, in the obesity field for, for a long time. Um, in fact, as, uh, as late as uh, January of 2018, um, JAMA uh, had a Viewpoint article about counting calories as an approach to achieving weight control. And it had a very simple prescription that if a patient reduces their caloric ingestion by 500 calories a day for seven days, he or she would lose about one pound of body weight per week. Um, so calorie counting uh, is, uh, is this effective way of losing weight, according to this article. The problem is, is it's just plain wrong. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of effort to realize that it must be wrong, because if you take, for example, a 100-kilogram man uh, who might be eating 3,000 calories per day to maintain their body weight and put that person on a 2,500-calorie-a-day a uh, diet, so cutting that 500 calories per day, um, that person would be predicted to disappear after four years. Um, so that's obviously nonsense. And the question is, where did this idea that uh, this uh, 3,500 calorie per pound um, uh, rule of weight loss and the simple matter of counting calories to achieve weight loss uh, would, would, uh, would come into place? And one of the big problems with this idea is that it treats calorie intake and calorie output as independent quantities. Um, and this idea that, uh, yes, it's true that uh, an imbalance between calorie input and calorie expenditure or output will uh, correspond to a change in body weight and body fat because that's basically just the first law of thermodynamics. However, uh, what does not follow is that if one does cut their calorie intake by a certain amount, uh, that this 3,500 calorie per pound rule presumes that nothing happens to calorie expenditure. And as a result of this constant deficit in calories, you have to make up for that deficit by burning endogenous fuel stores, in particular body fat. And that should lead, therefore, if this theory was correct, to a linear rate of body fat and weight loss, like we saw in the previous slide. Um, that that does not happen tells you something very interesting about the system. It's not this simple input output put uh, scale, it's a regulated system that we have feedback loops, uh, negative feedback loops in particular uh, from signals like leptin derived from uh, uh, body adipose tissue. And, uh, and those signal to the brain, in particular the hypothalamus, to regulate how much your appetite changes as a result of changing your body weight, um, as well as your calorie output. Uh, how does that uh, depend on both the calorie intake as well as any weight changes that you've experienced in the past? Uh, we heard a very nice lecture at the beginning of this uh, series uh, by Laura Heisler about uh, a lot of the molecular mechanisms by which uh, these uh, uh, the uh, calorie intake side um, is, is influenced by signals coming from the periphery like leptin, GLP-1, PYY, uh, etc. Um, I'm not going to talk much about that because uh, I actually don't do that kind of research. The kind of research that I do is to try to quantify these various feedback loops. Um, my background is in physics, 
And uh, I like to think of this system as kind of like an engineer would think of the system and say, if I want to understand the relative feedback control strengths of the feedback circuit that regulates calorie expenditure as compared to the feedback circuit that regulates calorie intake, the way I would do that is if I was an engineer is I would perturb the system. I'd kick it in some way, in a known way, and measure the response of the system. And that would give me information about the feedback strength of these circuits. So for example, um, if I did a calorie restriction experiment, if I cut the amount of calories coming in by some known quantity, I could then measure how the body responds by both decreasing calorie expenditure over time dynamically, as well as how the body composition might change and uh, thereby impinge on these signals that affect the brain. And so those kinds of experiments, these calorie restriction experiments have been done, you know, many, many times over the past century or so. And one of the things that um, my group did when we started uh, doing research at the NIH was to build mathematical models of how this body actually responds dynamically. And uh, we've published several times on these models. You can read uh, various papers about it. But the basic idea is to model how energy metabolism changes in response to perturbations in food intake and physical activity. And so we've developed several of these kinds of models and various degrees of complexity and, um, and validated those models in independent data sets. Uh, and we've even uh, come up with a online tool that people can use. It's on the NIH website. It's called the NIH Body Weight Planner. And you can plug in your basic uh, information about your baseline demographics and anthropometrics and uh, answer a couple of questions about your physical activity at work and leisure time and enter some interventions to your physical activity um, as well as your diet. And you can see how energy expenditure and body weight and composition change over time. I'm not going to talk too much about that because that's a lot of published uh, literature there. Um, but, uh, but just uh, what you can come away with that is that we actually have quite a bit of information about the relationship of how changing calorie intake actually does change calorie expenditure. So you cannot make that simple, um, that simple uh, concept of keeping calorie expenditure constant as you change calorie intake. It's a dynamic equation, um, it's, uh, and it's nonlinear, and you can see how that plays out over time, and I'll share with you some examples of that. What I want to move on to is something a little bit more novel, which is trying to quantify the appetite uh, feedback control circuit. And the way you would do that, analogous to the um, calorie output side of the feedback circuit, uh, instead of perturbing calorie intake, you would like to be able to perturb calorie expenditure in some known way and see how appetite changes in response uh, to that perturbation in calorie expenditure. So in other words, uh, what this little animation just showed was if I was to increase calorie expenditure, um, above that of calorie intake, then I have to mobilize those endogenous stores to meet, meet the energy deficit, but I might increase calorie intake as a result of that. So to measure the feedback circuit for appetite, I have to be able to both change calorie output in some controlled way and also measure calorie intake in, in, a, in a quantitative way in order to uh, measure that feedback control circuit. So. Uh, Measuring calorie intake, uh, again, uh, it's not as simple as it might seem. In fact, researchers have a very tough time measuring calorie intake in people. It's something that uh, Winkler called in 2005 the fundamental flaw in obesity research. And what he was pointing out was that the usual instruments that we have uh, in nutrition science to measure what people are eating, things like diet diaries or food frequency questionnaires or 24-hour recalls, might give us some very interesting information about the types of food that people are eating. Um, but when it comes to uh, measuring the absolute calorie amounts, something that's been known now for decades is that they dramatically underestimate the number of calories. And it's a, it's a very noisy measure as well. So um, there are ways around this, and, and uh, they turn out to be quite expensive, at least one of the ways, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But we proposed something much more inexpensive and simpler, and it was based on this idea that, as I showed you before, we have these models that say, when we know what the changes in calorie intake are in controlled experiments, 
we can model how metabolism and energy expenditure or calorie expenditure change and thereby predict the weight and body fat changes that, that occur. Our proposal was to pose the inverse problem. What if we knew the body weight changes and, uh, and measured those repeatedly and used those as inputs to the same mathematical model and could we ask the question, what must have been the changes in calorie intake, accounting for the changes in energy expenditure that occur, that are dynamic in time, that underlie the observed body weight changes? And so that was a great idea in theory, but in order to validate such a model or such a, a method, you actually have to have uh, some gold standard data of where people are being measured uh, for their calorie intake. And that data didn't exist until actually quite recently um, in a relative terms, uh, only about five years ago, when the results of uh, the uh, long-term calorie restriction study was published um, called the Calorie Study. Um, and this was a multi-site study where people were in, interested in investigating uh, the effects of a 25% constant calorie restriction over two years in, in a group of people um, that were not obese. They, they actually, these folks uh, were overweight or in the normal weight range, but they were um, supposed to ungo, undergo this uh, intensive uh, lifestyle intervention to cut their calorie intake by a constant 25%. And as part of uh, th that, uh, that multi-site study, they employed some biomarker measurements or tracer measurements, kind of like we saw in the previous um, lecture in this series called doubly labeled water, um, over the course of this, uh, this two-year experiment. So everywhere where there's a red arrow, they delivered a dose of doubly labeled water um, and measured body composition with DEXA. And so the idea here is that if you know the change in body composition between successive uh, DEXA measurements, then you know the change in body fat, which gives you the best estimate of the change in body energy stores. If you use doubly labeled water uh, to measure um, CO2 production, you can estimate the, uh, the energy expenditure over those time periods. And then by difference, uh, something called the intake balance method, you can therefore infer the average energy intake or calorie intake between those pairs of successive red lines um, or, or arrows. And this is very expensive. Uh, I'm, I'm estimating that over the calorie study, it would cost about a million dollars to, to complete these measurements. And what we said was, let's just take the body weight measurements of every individual subject and, um, and we'll uh, have some information about their baseline anthropometrics and and, and demographics, and we will calculate the, uh, the change in energy intake uh, according to our model. And we can compare them, therefore, with these very expensive measurements with the intake balance method. And so when we did that, you can see here that the blue bars are the model predictions for the mean, um, and the doubly labeled water and DEXA measurements uh, are in the gray bars. And what I think you can appreciate is that um, the model actually does pretty darn well for computing the average uh, energy expend and energy intake changes over the course of this two-year calorie restriction. In fact, it was within 40 calories per day at each of these different time points. Um, so this is pretty exciting because it provides us with a relatively cheap tool to um, just repeatedly measure a person's body weight over time and use um, this mathematical model to calculate what the underlying changes in energy intake must have been to correspond to those um, observed repeated body weight measurements. Um, and we have a tool that if people are interested, they could email me and we can send a little Java applet that will allow you to import your own body weight uh, data that you may have, and we can calculate uh, from that the changes in energy intake over time. So that helps us with at least one um, one of the aspects of, of measuring the feedback control circuit, we can now, by repeatedly measuring somebody's body weight, we can uh, measure their changes in calorie intake. Well, what about changing calorie expenditure? You might think, okay, well, that's pretty easy. We can just put people on an exercise program and increase their energy expenditure. Um, well, that might be possible, um, and people have certainly done those kinds of studies. Uh, there's no good placebo control <laughs> for exercise, and one of the things that we would like to do, ideally, 
is um, intervene in this system in a way that people don't have uh, conscious knowledge that you've actually changed their calorie output because people respond, for example, to exercise in very different ways. They might reward themselves by eating more um, or they might have the opposite reaction and say, I'm not gonna ruin all this hard work that I'm doing with my exercise by eating an extra slice of pizza. I'm gonna do better in my diet as well. In other words, there's a certain amount of conscious control here that, uh, that, that we want to avoid. And so this has been a problem about how does one actually perturb calorie output in a way um, that you can do in a placebo controlled manner. And that was not really all that possible until relatively recently when a class of drugs uh, for type two diabetes came on the market called um, uh, sodium glucose co-transporter two inhibitors that act on the kidneys. And basically what they do is increase the amount of glucose that's spilled in the urine, essentially acting as an energy sink. And uh, with, uh, with the doses that we're interested in, you can spill about 90 gr grams per day of glucose in the urine, thereby perturbing calorie output in this way. And we can ask the question, when you do a placebo control trial in which some individuals get these SGLT2 inhibitors and others do not, they get the placebo, um, what happens to weight change? Uh, do they lose as much weight as be would be expected without any feedback control of calorie intake? In other words, do they just lose the predicted amount of weight given how much uh, calories are expended or, or released in the urine in addition to the calorie expenditure slowing as a result of weight loss? Or do they increase their calorie intake in some way to compensate if there was a feedback control circuit on calorie intake? And so uh, we partnered with some folks at Johnson & Johnson who had conducted a, uh, a placebo-controlled trial of SGLT2 inhibitors and had measured repeated body weights. And uh, what you can see right away is that uh, these people lose weight, um, but they don't lose anywhere near as much weight as you would predict based on the amount of calories spilled in the urine after accounting for the slowing of metabolism that takes place with, um, with weight loss per se. In fact, they lose about a third of the amount of weight that you would expect, suggesting that they, uh, and in fact, what we quantified was that their energy intake is a going above baseline um, to the tune of about 95 calories per day above baseline for every kilogram of body weight loss. Um, so, this is the first, and albeit the quantification is somewhat tentative, this is the first um, estimation of the feedback control strength of the appetite feedback circuit in humans. And so to put that in perspective, um, all of those many, many calorie restriction experiments that we talked about before that have quantified how calorie output changes uh, suggest that the feedback control strength on the calorie output side of the uh, equation here is about uh, 25 kilocalories per day decrease in energy expenditure or calorie output for every kilogram of weight lost. Whereas on the energy intake side, uh, appetite increases above baseline by about 95 calories per day for every kilo of weight loss. So a much higher feedback control strength on the appetite side of the equation. And so what I'd like to do now is just show you how this feedback control circuits, these parallel feedback control circuits play out when someone is trying to cut calories in their diet as a means of losing weight. And so we'll return to this intensive lifestyle restriction that was intended to reduce a calorie intake by 25% uh, across the board. Uh, here's the, the, the curves for the men in that study. And you can see that they achieve some pretty substantial weight loss after about a year. Um, but that plateaus after that, right? They don't continue losing weight forever, like we uh, saw in that hypothetical situation in the first slide. Um, and the good chunk of that weight loss is coming from body fat. Under the, underneath these uh, body composition changes, you can uh, plot the dynamic changes in both energy intake and energy expenditure uh, that, uh, that were taking place. And what you can see here is that energy intake drops a lot initially, the blue curve, a drop of about uh, 700 plus calories per day um, at the onset of the intervention. That actually does correspond to approximately 25% calorie restriction. Energy expenditure also decreases in the orange curves here and the orange uh, dots are the data. 
uh, with doubly labeled water. And you can see that that goes down pretty rapidly at the, at the onset of the intervention and then sort of plateaus at around 300 calories per day reduction. But what I find really fascinating, um, and especially when we first started looking at these ubiquitous weight loss curves that are not just for this intervention, but many others where you plateau after a year, is that there seemed to be this exponential decay of diet adherence. Remember, the idea here was to have these folks institute a constant calorie reduction over the course of this um, two-year experiment of about 25%. And what you can see is that they don't achieve that at all by the end of two years. And in fact, it looks like their adherence to the diet is progressively getting worse. So what's happening? Are these people just cheating? Are they just going back to their old ways um, despite the intensive efforts of the study team to kind of keep these people on track. Um, I used to think so. I don't think so anymore because what you actually have to consider here is that uh, you're dealing with a system where uh, appetite is increasing above baseline by 95 calories per day for every kilo of weight loss. And we know what their weight loss was, so we can plot this dashed blue curve, which corresponds to the, um, the increase in appetite that's predicted according to that feedback control circuit. And what I think you can see is that their actual intake, the solid blue curve, and the dashed blue curve, which is what they want to be eating according to their um, uh, that appetite feedback control circuit, uh, is actually pretty constant. That's the effort that these folks are putting into trying to uh, adhere to this intervention. And if you plot the difference between the dashed curve and the solid curve, uh, you can see that there is this large, persistent, perceived effort as a over the course of this intensive lifestyle intervention, suggesting that a constant effort has diminishing returns as you fight against a greater and greater feedback strength on the appetite side of this equation. So this is a, a different way of about thinking uh, of thinking about uh, calorie restriction and how calories play out over time when people are trying to cut calories to lose weight. Um, and, and, uh, and so that, that really poses, uh, I think, an important point when you think about uh, weight loss. You can't think about this as something you only do temporarily uh, to lose weight and, and then you can go back to your regular behavior. Um, you actually have to have this constant, per, uh, constant effort to uh, persistently change your, your behavior over time in order to maintain the weight that you lose, uh, which will plateau in the first year or so of an intensive lifestyle intervention. That is, a, unless of course there's ways to subvert these feedback circuits uh, that regulate calorie expenditure and appetite. And in fact, that turns us to the next question about carbs, uh, because we uh, learned many years ago that there might be ways to subvert this circuit. In fact, Dr. Atkins' uh, Diet Revolution used to have a, a subtitle that people don't uh, often remember, which was the high calorie way to stay thin forever. Um, in other words, maybe you don't even have to cut calories in your diet to lose weight and keep it off forever. Um, if there was a way for the body to burn excess calories as a, by just changing the composition of the, your diet, maybe you could subvert some of these uh, feedback circuits that regulate calorie expenditure and uh, calorie intake. And so this idea um, has received a lot of attention and it's been revitalized in recent years, in particular by David Ludwig at Harvard University, um, who has uh, postulated that this, not only are low carb diets potentially effective for many, many people, and there's no doubt that they are, um, but they, f they form a basis, uh, an underlying theoretical basis, um, uh, which is uh, the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity. And the idea here is that uh, the main culprit in causing people to gain body fat is insulin secretion. Um, and one of the things that we know about uh, uh, insulin secretion is that it's driven in, to a large extent by the carbohydrates in your diet. And so the idea here is that by eating a high carbohydrate diet, you're increasing the amount of insulin secretion, which uh, drives your adipose tissue into storage mode, um, basically decreasing the amount of circulating fuels that are available for oxidation in the rest of the body. And that's sensed by the brain and increases your hunger and energy intake and also suppresses metabolic rate. Uh, 
um, and thereby decreasing energy expenditure. So this is a very interesting model. Uh, the way that uh, Dr. Ludwig describes it is he says that a high carbohydrate diet produces postprandial hyperinsulinemia, promoting deposition of calories and fat cells instead of oxidation and lean tissues, and thereby predisposes to weight gain through increased hunger, slowing metabolic rate, or both. Um, so this model, contrary to this, what some critics have said, does not break you know, the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, all calories are still accounted for here, um, but it turns the direction of causation on its head compared to the usual way of thinking about things. Obesity is not caused by just overconsumption of calories and, and decreased physical activity, for example, um, driving excess calories into fat tissue. It's the other way around. It's the high carbs in the diet leading to excess insulin secretion essentially sucking those calories into fat stores and thereby signaling to the, uh, to the uh, rest of the body and the brain that there's insufficient calories available, the so-called internal starvation that increases hunger and decreases energy expenditure. Um, this idea that insulin plays this predominant role has even led to a corollary of the carbohydrate insulin model, which suggests that maybe you can't even lose body fat unless you cut carbs. Um, Gary Taubes is quoted here as saying that any diet succeeds, uh, uh, does so because the dieter restricts fattening carbohydrates and that those who lose fat on a diet do so because of what they are not eating, the fattening carbohydrates. And the observation here is that uh, basically even people who go on low fat diets and lose body fat, compared to baseline, they may also be cutting carbs. And so how do you know that it was the fat in the diet that was being cut that caused the fat loss versus the calories in the diet being cut that caused the fat loss versus the carbs. Uh, the only way to know that for sure would be to only cut carbs, keeping fat and protein at baseline, or only cut fat, keeping carbs and protein at baseline. And that experiment had never been done before until we did it at the NIH, where we brought 19 men and women with obesity into our metabolic ward at the NIH where they spent a pair of two week periods living with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And on one occasion, uh, we cut 30% of their baseline calories only coming from carbs. That's the blue bars here, uh, the reduced carb diet, uh, keeping fat and protein at baseline. And in random order, uh, those same folks received either that diet or the reduced fat diet in red, where we cut the same number of calories, but kept carbs and protein constant and derived the calorie restriction only from fat. And so if the carbohydrate insulin model is correct, only the reduced carbohydrate diet should lead to a reduction in insulin secretion. That should, uh, if we keep the calories constant, that should uh, thereby uh, lead to uh, that reduction in insulin secretion should lead to a shift towards increasing fat mobilization from adipose tissue, uh, providing those calories to the to the rest of the body that were trapped inside the fat cells, and increasing energy expenditure. Um, and alternatively, if you reduce fat in the diet and keep carbs at baseline, insulin secretion shouldn't change, and therefore you may not even be able to lose body fat according to uh, Gary Taubes' interpretation. So what happened in the study? Well, indeed, only the reduced carbohydrate diet led to a reduction in insulin secretion. These are, this was measured um, by collecting 24-hour urines in these folks, and we measured the amount of C-peptide that was excreted in the urine. And C-peptide is a molecule that's co-secreted with insulin uh, by the beta cells. Uh, but unlike insulin, which is degraded in multiple tissues, C-peptide is cleared only by the kidneys in the urine. And therefore, by counting how much C-peptide was in the urine, we can measure how much insulin was secreted over the course of the day. And in these same folks, what you can see is that the, only the reduced carbohydrate diet led to an excess of a 20% uh, percent reduction in insulin secretion. Nothing happened with the reduced fat diet. We put these folks periodically in respiratory chambers to measure their oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide production, um, as well as, uh, and the ratio of those two quantities gives you the respiratory quotient, which is an index of how much carbohydrate versus fat that you're burning. A value closer to one means that you're burning entirely carbs. A value closer to 0.7 means that you're burning entirely fat. And what you can see is that uh, during the baseline phase, these folks were 
burning a mixture of carbohydrate and fat with an RQ of about 0.86. Um, on at day zero, when you cut carbs in the diet, you can see that in the blue curve and data points here, uh, people shift towards burning more fat. Um, indeed, that goes along with one of the carbohydrate insulin model predictions. Whereas the reduced fat diet, which led to no changes in insulin secretion, uh, there was no shift in metabolic fuel uh, um, uh, being uh, oxidized in such a way that nothing happened to the respiratory quotient. However, uh, body fat changes are not just about burning more fat, it's a balance between how much fat you're eating and how much fat you're burning. And in the case of the reduced carb diet, where the amount of fat that you were eating stayed the same and the amount of uh, fat that you were burning went up, you certainly lost body fat. But in the case of the reduced fat diet, um, the amount of fat that you were burning stayed more or less the same, but the amount of fat that you took in went down by 800 calories a day or so. And so in balance, over those six days of the carbohydrate versus fat restriction in these same 19 men and women with obesity, it was the reduced fat diet that resulted in increased fat loss uh, compared to uh, the reduced carb diet. Both uh, led to fat loss, um, but uh, slightly more with the reduced fat diet. So certainly you don't require carbohydrate restriction to lose body fat. So we can, uh, we can pretty much definitively say, at least in the short period of time, that this idea that you require carbohydrate restriction, require a reduction in 24-hour insulin secretion to lose body fat is not correct. Um, but I would say that the differences between these two uh, diets uh, in terms of body fat loss are clinically meaningless. They're really small differences, differences that you could not detect outside of a metabolic ward where we control every morsel of food that people eat and have the most sophisticated uh, methods of measuring fat balance. Um, and indeed, you can actually quantify uh, where uh, some of these even minor differences were coming from because, in fact, only the reduced carbohydrate diet decreased energy expenditure. Um, so in contrast to the prediction of the carbohydrate insulin model, uh, where the reduction in insulin would alleviate the internal starvation and alleviate the suppression of metabolic rate, in fact, it went down um, significantly with the reduced carb diet, but the same people did not experience the same effect with the reduced fat diet. So when we published that study, a lot of folks in the low-carb community weren't too happy about it. Um, this is an example from Dr. Mark Hyman, who was writing a book at the time called Eat Fat, Get Thin, which was based on the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity. And he uh, devoted a couple pages of his book to discussing this study. Uh, one of the things he pointed out was that the low-carb diet uh, in the study wasn't really low-carb at all. And in fact, it included 29% of calories coming from carbs. Um, so maybe you need to get to a lower amount of carbohydrates to see these effects. The other thing he mentioned was because it was a metabolic ward study, it was very short in duration. And uh, maybe you needed to see a, a longer period of time. In particular, if we'd done the uh, study for a longer period, perhaps uh, the uh, respiratory quotient, instead of having the plateau, might have um, actually experienced a further drop and thereby allowing the uh, lower carb diet uh, to catch up to the low fat diet in terms of net fat balance. Of course, we didn't do that study, so uh, we don't know the answer to that question. Um, but we did conduct another study. Um, this time we actually looked at two months of, of an isocaloric diet where people stayed, uh, this was a multi-site study, and people stayed in four different uh, sites in uh, metabolic uh, wards uh, where they stayed continuously for two months, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the way we designed this study was to look at uh, these longer term changes in energy expenditure. And so what we did was we brought people in, we put them for two consecutive days in uh, these respiratory chambers, and we adjusted the energy intake uh, to basically match what they were burning inside the respiratory chambers. And then after we had done that for a, a pair of stays, uh, we clamped the number of calories and we also kept the amount of protein constant waited until the end of the first four-week period, and in the hashed, uh, the hatched uh, green box, uh, we conducted our baseline chamber uh, data 
uh, for the energy expenditure. And then we switch people to a 5% carb, 80% fat, 15% protein, constant protein, constant calorie diet, waited another four weeks, and the primary endpoint was to compare the pair of hatched boxes here for 24-hour energy expenditure. So what happened in this study? Well, as you might predict, um, the low-carb diet, the ketogenic diet, dramatically reduced uh, insulin secretion as measured by the same 24-hour C-peptide measurement, uh, this time decreasing it by about 50%. So very much less insulin was required by these people. That's incidentally, that's one of the reasons why I think people are very excited about these kinds of diets for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And I think that that excitement is, is justified. You don't require as much insulin to maintain normal glucose levels. And so if you have a disease like type 2 diabetes where you can't produce enough insulin to process the usual amounts of carbohydrate, perhaps it's a good idea to eat a diet that doesn't require you to produce as much insulin. At least that's the logic. But these folks did not have type 2 diabetes. Um, so their insulin secretion is 50% lower. It happens quickly and it persists for the entire uh, uh, second month on this study. Uh, they actually do go into ketosis quite rapidly and persistently over the course of that month of the ketogenic diet. Um, their respiratory quotient drops very quickly, and it stays dropped. It doesn't have another nosedive. Uh, so if there is further fat adaptation after the first week, um, it's going to have to take longer than a month uh, because we did not see it in, in a month. And I can't rule that out, but um, it, we don't have data to support it either. So what about the primary outcome of the study, the comparing the final pair of chamber days uh, for energy expenditure to the uh, final uh, on the ketogenic diet to the final pair of chamber stays on the uh, on the uh, uh, the normal diet, uh, we found no significant difference. Um, but we actually looked at all of the different chamber stays, um, and we actually did see something interesting: that transiently energy expenditure did increase, um, but that effect only lasted for um, you know a couple of weeks at most. And part of the reason might be because these folks actually started to um, go into negative nitrogen balance and using some of that uh, of the amino acids to produce glucose uh, by gluconeogenesis, which is a uh, ATP consuming process. And so that might underlie at least part of that increase in energy expenditure. But as a result of mobilizing those amino acids, in fact, uh, fat mass actually, uh, the loss of body fat actually slowed down on the ketogenic diet transiently. So we decided to look uh, systematically at all of the human experiments that had uh, performed isocaloric controlled feeding studies, keeping protein constant, obviously calories constant, and varying carbs and fat. And we did the systematic review and meta-analysis. And what we found was that um, overall, there was a signal uh, with increased energy expenditure with the actually the lower fat diets, not the lower carbohydrate diets, which is, which is in the opposite direction of what the carbohydrate insulin model predicts. Um, now, it's highly statistically significant when you look at the pooled weighted mean difference uh, favoring the lower fat diet. But again, this is clinically meaningless uh, 28 calorie a day uh, difference between the two diets. So um, I would argue that we're actually pretty darn good at keeping our energy expenditure more or less constant with wide swings in carbohydrate and fat. And similarly, if you look at body fat changes, uh, same sort of story, favoring greater fat loss with the lower fat diets, but a clinically meaningless difference of about 16 grams per day uh, over, the over the course of, uh, of, the of these studies. Now, you can argue that maybe these studies were all not done correctly, or they, maybe they all weren't long enough to observe the important effects. Um, and that's certainly possible. Um, but we don't have really good data to convince us at this point otherwise. So let's move on to the energy intake side of the equation. 
and test the energy intake predictions of the carbohydrate insulin model. If the energy expenditure side doesn't seem to be panning out, it doesn't mean that the appetite side uh, might be important. In other words, if you could uh, feed people these kinds of diets but not control their calories, allow them to eat as much or as little as they wanted, maybe feeding them a very low carbohydrate diet would uh, keep the insulin levels low and thereby suppress appetite and suppress hunger and allow people to consume fewer calories. Um, that's a certainly reasonable pr prediction of the, of the carbohydrate insulin model. And recently we uh, tested that prediction by bringing people into our metabolic ward for a 28 day continuous period, uh, randomizing them to uh, either a 10% carb, 75% fat diet, or a 10% fat, 75% carb diet. And uh, after two weeks switching them to the alternate diet, we provided them with uh, double their energy requirements and uh, basically instructed them to eat as much or as little as they want. And what we found was that uh, during the uh, low fat diet, we saw the expected uh, large swings in glucose and insulin secretion, whereas the low carb diet had much more modest changes in glucose and insulin secretion. So um, the, the uh, low fat diet should lead by the carbohydrate insulin model uh, to be trapping the fat inside the fat cells, starving the rest of the body of those calories and thereby causing increased hunger. Um, but unfortunately for that model, what we found was that uh, there was actually almost 700 calories per day less ad libitum energy intake on the low fat diet. Uh, compared to the low carb diet. So uh, this again, this is completely counter to the carbohydrate insulin model predictions, which suggested that the low carb diet by having lower insulin levels should lead to decreased hunger and as a result um, uh, lead to reduced energy intake. Um, incidentally, the, every individual of our, of our study uh, responded in a very similar fashion. Uh, this is pretty rare to see um, every individual doing more or less the same thing. Uh, usually there's more of heterogeneity in some responders versus non-responders. Um, so we were quite, quite surprised by how consistent this response was in these folks. There was actually more body fat as a result lost during uh, the low fat diet. After all, they were eating uh, 700 calories per day, uh, fewer calories. So that doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, take a lot of effort to explain that. Uh, one thing that was interesting was that despite the differences in calorie intake, there were no self-reported differences in hunger, satisfaction, fullness, or eating capacity between the diets. Um, you might suspect, okay, well, maybe they just didn't like the low-fat diet, but indeed there was no differences in pleasantness or familiarity of the foods um, in the meals of the low-carb versus the low-fat diet. So um, that kind of leads me to this issue of maybe, maybe we could transcend these diet wars. Maybe this constant pitting of low carb versus low fat against each other um, is, has been almost a waste of time from a practical standpoint. Um, and maybe we can focus on some of the commonalities of people who succeed on both low carb and low fat diets and try to understand something else about how diet influences our appetite, um, our metabolism. And uh, that got me thinking about one of the common factors of people who uh, make recommendations of to go on low carb or low fat diets is that they often recommend that you eat a lot of um, non-starchy uh, vegetables as kind of forming the base of the diet. And they also both uh, groups recommend that you avoid uh, the, you know, the center of your supermarket where the uh, so-called ultra-processed foods uh, belong. And so it uh, got me interested in this idea, and there's been some kind of epidemiological studies looking at trends in dietary patterns. Uh, this is one from uh, Jean-Claude Mubarak in Canada showing that over time, the proportion of uh, people's uh, food purchases coming from ultra-processed foods has been going up uh, progressively over the years in parallel with the rise in obesity, um, whereas culinary ingredients in, uh, uh, as a 
means of home cooking have been decreasing precipitously. And so maybe there's something about the uh, quality of the foods um, as measured by the degree and extent and purpose of processing that is driving some of the changes that we've seen in obesity prevalence. Uh, these are only correlations. Um, and But there's this group uh, uh, that has developed a system of, ca of categorizing food, and they more or less ignore macronutrients, and they focus on the degree and purpose of processing. And so on the top panel, you see relatively unprocessed or minimally processed foods. On the bottom, uh, you see photographs of ultra-processed foods. And uh, when you ask what is it about the, the, the foods in the bottom panel that cause people to, to overeat, uh, and gain weight. One of the uh, frequent uh, comebacks is that basically it's the high salt, sugar, and fat, and low fiber foods uh, that are characteristic of ultra-processed foods that are causing people to overeat. But of course, these are nutrients. And so is it the nutrients or is it something else about the processing that's, uh, that's potentially causing people to overeat? And there had never been a randomized controlled trial of this until we decided to to do one at the NIH, where again, very similar to the low carb and low fat ad libitum diet study, we brought people in uh, for 28 consecutive days and randomized them to 14 days of eating an ultra processed diet, where more than 80% of calories come from ultra processed foods, um, or an unprocessed diet, where 0% uh, of calories come from ultra processed foods and more than 80% come from minimally or unprocessed foods. Uh, the, the meals had similar amounts of calories, carbs, fat, protein, sugar, sodium, and fiber. They were presented at twice their energy requirements, and the, the simple instructions were eat as much or as little as you want. And we had 20 adults without diabetes conduct this study, and we were interested primarily in energy intake. And what you can see is that despite these diets being matched for those various nutrients, um, the ultra-processed uh, diet led to, um, led to 500 calories a day, more energy intake over the two weeks in these same folks as compared to um, the unprocessed diet that was matched for these various nutrients. And very interestingly and importantly, it was the uh, these same folks when they were consuming the ultra-processed diet, they gained body fat, whereas when they were uh, exposed to the unprocessed uh, diet, they spontaneously decrease their energy intake and lost body fat. That's actually slightly different than what we saw in the low carb and low fat diets, which were relatively minimally processed. Both diets uh, did not lead to increased body fat. Um, and so that's something interesting that we might have a, time, ch uh, a chance to chat about. In the ultra processed diet study, uh, the excess calorie intake came from both carbohydrates and fats. Uh, protein was constant between the two diets, protein intake. Um, again, there were no differences in hunger, fullness, satisfaction, or eating capacity. And uh, people rated the meals equally pleasant, and the foods were equally familiar between the diets. So uh, it's not that they liked one more than the other, at least they self-reported uh, not liking one more than another. Um, and that was not the reason, apparently, for the differences in energy intake. So that leads us to, uh, you know, that our studies overall have kind of been interpreted as a, uh, by the community and provides a little bit of a Rorschach test. Um, and for example, if you believe that there's some ingredient like artificial sweeteners or flavor additives in ultra-processed foods that cause people to overeat, or maybe the microbiome is somehow shifted in a way to promote overeating, then um, you might ignore other differences in the diets, uh, including, for example, that the non-beverage energy density of the ultra-processed diet was about double that of the unprocessed diet. Um, on the other hand, if you believe energy density is the primary culprit, you might ignore the fact that the low-carbohydrate diet from the uh, previous study had the same energy density as the ultra-processed diet, and yet only the ultra-processed diet led to gain in body fat. So I think that our studies kind of show that these simple models of obesity and treatment um, actually turn out to be more complicated in reality. And our goal is to kind of hope that our studies will help us better understand the underlying physiology and test some of these ideas 
um, in, in people under very controlled environments. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank the folks who do most of the work in these studies. Um, uh, they're listed in blue here who've been uh, post-baccalaureate uh, fellows in the lab and postdocs, um, as well as our, the uh, research nurses and uh, the nursing staff at the NIH Metabolic Unit, um, and especially our volunteer su study subjects who uh, go through the ringer with us when they spend months of their life uh, working on these studies. So with that, I'll wrap up and hopefully we'll have a few minutes for questions. All right, thanks so much, Kevin, for the fantastic presentation. And yes, with that, we'll move on to the Q&A. Okay, let's jump right in. Here's a, a great question to kick things off. Uh, Kevin, have your studies impacted your own diet? Yeah, I get that question quite a lot. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, for the most part, you know, our studies have, uh, have, have kind of had an impact in the, in the sense that I guess we, I try to stay away from ultra processed foods as much as possible. Um, but I have to say that our studies have not impacted my diet anywhere near as much as having two small children have <laughs> impacted my diet because I essentially am uh, eating leftovers from the, from the kids. And since they, um, they, they are exposed to uh, a small amount of ultra processed food, which gets consumed relatively quickly. I am left with a relatively unprocessed diet on the plates afterwards. Excellent. Um, another good question here, and I know nutrition is often touted to have a number of health benefits, but is there something that you can do with your diet to improve your immune system, uh, for example, to prevent or mitigate COVID-19? Yeah, that's, that's a topic that's been in the talked a lot about obviously recently and you know our our studies don't directly um, address that question I, and I think that you know uh, the immune system seems to be obviously in states of nutritional deficiencies uh, um, certain micronutrient deficiencies and protein deficiencies um, impacted negatively by um, by by these deficiencies uh, you know I think that the science of understanding how diet and the types of foods that we choose, how they impact um, our immune system and our ability to fight off infections or the ability to prevent infections in the first place is a very interesting and active area of research um, that we're obviously very interested in in recent days. Excellent. Great answer. Um, a question here from Sanjeet. He's asked, uh, how do gut health and gut microbiota affect obesity? That's a great question, and I wish we knew the answer to that question. Um, there have been a lot of association studies. Uh, we have only recently begun to um, explore the role of the, the gut microbiota in terms of how it responds to different diets. Uh, we had a, a, a paper that came out um, in collaboration with Peter Turnbaugh and Cell recently looking at um, basically microbiota shifts uh, as a result of, of uh, ketogenic diets. Um, and so what I think we, we uh, are at the beginning stages of understanding the, um, these associations and what I think is lacking in humans at least is good uh, randomized trials with causal uh, evidence suggesting that the gut microbiome plays a, a major role in humans. I don't think we know the answer to that question yet. Excellent. All right. Great answer. Um, another good question here. What are your thoughts on the constrained energy expenditure theory? Uh, and how should we apply this to our lives to help manage our calorie balance or understanding our calorie needs? So it's a, it's a very good question. This is um, a theory that's been put forth by Herman Ponser, who's now at Duke University. For those who aren't familiar with the theory, it basically says that we regulate energy expenditure in such a way as um, if we increase our calorie demands for physical activity and exercise, that um, the body responds to that in a way by decreasing calories expended on other bodily functions. So for example, your resting metabolic rate might decrease as a result of an increase in physical activity energy expenditure. And so a simple additive model of where you um, just you know go jogging for an hour and burn you know, three or 400 calories um, that you can basically count that in a simple summation towards energy balance may not be correct. I think that there's some very interesting uh, preliminary data in humans. There is a dearth 
I went to the, not a complete dearth, but a relative absence of longitudinal data in people demonstrating this phenomenon. And I think it's very interesting. Um, and I, I like Herman's work a lot. And I think that it, it certainly deserves more research. Here's a good question. How does an individual's own genetics and physiology influence how they respond to calorie restriction or even a low fat or low carb diet? Yeah, great question. Um, the, the short answer is we don't know. <laughs> we know that, for example, obesity has a huge gen genetic component. You know, sometimes in excess, uh, the heritability studies suggest in excess of 50% of the differences in body mass index are explained by genes. Um, what we know about the genes that have been identified in GWAS studies is that uh, differential gene expression of those genes is primarily in the brain or the central nervous system. And so um, what we think is happening is that uh, there's a variety of propensities uh, of people to respond to our food environment in particular um, in, in ways that explain a lot of the variability between people and why is it that some people have been most susceptible to the obesogenic food environment that we currently find ourselves in with um, excess ultra-processed foods, for example, that are convenient and cheap and ubiquitous. Um, what we don't understand yet is uh, the genetic component of how, um, how genes may explain why one person is more successful on a weight loss diet than another uh, person. So that sort of personalized or precision nutrition approach um, has not yet uh, borne out in, uh, in, in randomized controlled trials uh, that are prospective. However, there are some intriguing insights in retrospectively in analyzing uh, you know, what genes may have been responsible for, um, uh, for, uh, for why some, someone is successful on a low carb diet, for example, whereas another person is successful on a low fat diet. I think there's a lot of future research to be done there, um, but I also don't think that we can discount the possibility that even the person who was successful uh, losing weight on the low carb diet, had they been randomized to the low fat diet, for example, they may have done equally as well um, or vice versa because maybe that person was at the right social situation in their life, they had the right financial stability, they had the supportive partner, maybe those things play a, a, a large role in success in addition to genetics. And I don't think we've designed the right studies yet to tease those uh, various factors out, but I think it deserves a lot more study. Excellent, okay. Um, great question here from uh, Albert. He's asked, uh, what is the role that fiber plays uh, in some of these dietary changes? It's a great question. We, of course, don't know the answer. Uh, one of the challenges of human nutrition studies is that um, it's, it's very hard to control all the factors of the diets. And so um, fiber was different between, for example, the, um, the low-fat diet and the low-carb diet, with the low-fat diet having quite a bit more fiber than the low carb diet. And that's pretty typical of the way those diets are often implemented. Um, so what we can't say is how much of the difference, for example, in the energy intake that we saw was due to the higher fiber intake on the low fat diet versus the fact that it had a, a much lower uh, energy density, for example, the number of calories per gram was quite a bit different. Um, so we can't actually isolate the mechanism. Uh, and that's a little bit frustrating as a physiologist to, to not necessarily be isolating the mechanism. Similarly, in the, um, in the ultra-processed versus unprocessed diets where we actually match the amount of fiber, in one case coming from a fiber supplement and the other case coming from um, sort of whole foods, uh, the type of fiber is very different with the uh, unprocessed diet having a, uh, a lot of uh, insoluble fiber, whereas the, um, the fiber supplements were soluble fiber supplements. Uh, and so even though the total amount of fiber was matched between the diets and the people actually consumed the same amount of fiber, the type of fiber was very different. And so I think you can see that to really isolate these mechanisms one by one, one would have to have many, many, many diet arms. Uh, 
uh, where you match certain factors and then you had another arm where they weren't matched and you would try to kind of manipulate these diets in the, those ways. And of course, every time you make one of those manipulations, you have to remove something else from the diet in order to do that. And so this is why nutrition science isn't rocket science. It's, it's actually way harder. Uh, we've had quite a few questions about uh, timing. So when you eat, uh, but does the time of day that you consume calories or fat or food, uh, does timing play a role in uh, weight loss or weight gain? Yeah, it's a great question. It's not something that our lab has, has studied in particular, um, but there's a lot of interest. I would point you to a couple of different researchers who are looking at that, um, in particular, Courtney Peterson. Uh, has been studying that quite a bit. So check out some of her work um, and looking at, uh, at uh, time-restricted feeding and uh, the time of day and effects on energy metabolism. Um, it seems like there may be some effects there that are in, important in terms of insulin sensitivity, um, but uh, energy expenditure effects don't seem to be very major. And I don't think she's looked much at appetite yet. Um, and uh, but I think that there's a lot of interesting research to be done there. I, we just haven't done much of it ourselves. All right. Great answer. Well, thanks so much, Kevin, for all of your fantastic insights today, uh, both in your presentation as well as the Q&A session. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. So in closing, thank you again for taking part in this Inside Scientific webinar produced in partnership with the American Physiological Society. And we look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone.